Go to Singapore. How are you doing? Um, I'm going to take my shoes off. All right, so I'm Mike. I'm a web developer from Australia. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today. I've been through Singapore many times. I've never actually stayed. Um, I'm super excited and I'm really enjoying it so far. I'm really looking forward uh, to JSConf Asia as well. Um, so I'm going to be there. Please come and say hello if you have like any questions about tonight's talk. You can talk to me there. You can talk to me here. Uh, whatever you like. You can also talk to me on uh, Twitter as well. Um, so if you don't feel comfortable asking a question or, you, you know, whatever, you just missed the opportunity, do it there. It's not actually the law. Um, I apologise for that. I just, I don't know what I was thinking. Um, so the title of my talk today is Understanding uh, CSS Custom Properties. Um, and the reason that it is called this is it's kind of based on a talk that I gave in a blog post that I wrote previously, which was a strategy guide um, to CSS Custom Properties. I mean, I encourage you to have a look at that if you want a little bit more detail about what I'm speaking about tonight. But the truth is I left my slide deck at home. So I've recreated this um, with what I had online and stuff. And um, we're going without notes today. So hopefully this goes all right. I want to give you a quick demo firstly of what we can do um, with CSS custom properties. Was that Phil Nash in the background, by the way? He's also from Australia. Um, I'm going to call him out and get him to pick tonight's color scheme. Um, pick a color, Phil, for your primary. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> now, do you remember the do you remember the hex number? <laughs> A anyone? Is it like let's just pick green? It's kind of a bluish green, right? He's the guy who might be giving away tickets. What do you want? Yeah, so be nice to him. Phil, what do you want as your secondary color, mate? Say it again. Christ, where do I even enter a hex thing? Can you give me a HSL? <laughs> Mate, you're getting hot pink, okay? That's what's happening. All right, so you can see that the custom properties have been written down here, and this is, this is genuinely happening in the browser at the moment. Um, we're just writing this to like a style tag, and this is actually affecting the slides, and you can see it's already affected the title of this slide, and hopefully the title of the slides that come as well. Um, so that's kind of how they work. I want to give you a little bit more detail about how they work, but I'm not going to focus too much on the syntax. Um, just very briefly, um, they're, they're not really like variables, but they sort of are. Um, and you probably know that we use a dollar sign to denote a variable in SAS, and unless we use an at symbol. And custom properties have a similar convention. They have a dash dash um, prefix, but you'll notice two other small differences there, and that is that they're um, contained within a CSS selector, in this case, the root selector, and we will talk more about that in a moment. Uh, but also there's a different syntax for assigning a value to a custom property uh, than there is for retrieving that value. So when we're retrieving the value of a custom property, we use that little var function there. And um, that should be familiar to people who've used like calc or minmax or other sort of color functions um, or any of those more functional parts of CSS that are making their way um, into the modern language. So hopefully that's not too confusing. Um, the other difference is that preprocessor variables can be used almost anywhere. And this means that they can be used like in breakpoints, um, selectors, values, basically anywhere. And there's a whole bunch of examples here where you can see like I'm writing out like the selectors variable here and I'm using it as a value and I'm using it in, a, in an at rule. And all of these um, examples would be invalid if we were using custom properties. So custom properties can be used anywhere that normal CSS properties are valid, and that basically means between these curly braces here. Um, so you can see, again, um, we've assigned that to a particular selector between those curly braces, and that also can be used inside like a media rule as well, so we can um, change the value of the same custom property um, in different contexts within the same page. And that really is the key difference, so just take note of that. Um, so similarly, that var statement can be used anywhere that normal CSS values are valid. And what that means is that they can be used as single values, um, in shorthand statements. Um, they can even be used inside calc and color functions and things like that. So you can see there's an example of assigning a, a single value to a color. Um, I'm using it as a um, shorthand for the right margin there. Um, and I'm also using it in a calc equation here. Um, to apply padding. So there's lots of different ways you can use CSS variables. Um, and if you're thinking about the var statement, all you have to remember is, is it somewhere where I can put a normal CSS value or a unit type thing. And that pretty much ends my crash course on CSS custom properties. There's probably a whole lot more that you want to know, um, but that should be enough to sort of 
um, to help you with the rest of the talk, I guess. Um, so cosmetic differences aside, the most significant difference between preprocessor variables um, and custom properties um, is that custom properties are dynamic. So you possibly have some idea what like um, dynamic variables mean um, and what static variables mean, but as far as preprocessors are concerned, what, what's static? So preprocessor variables are static, uh, custom properties are dynamic. So static as far as preprocessors is concerned means that the value of the variable can change, but it's not going to update anything anywhere else in the page or anywhere when the browser changes. So what that means is I can set the background variable here to red, and then it'll be output as red. So this is the, this is the this CSS, this is the CSS that gets generated. Um, and again, I can change it to blue, it's not changing the one above. And variables sometimes do behave like that if they're dynamic, depending on, um, depending on the language and how they're used. Uh, but basically, with preprocessors, you should be able to read an entire .scss file, and if you've got enough patience, you should be able to work out exactly what the output is without needing to know any other context about the HTML, um, the device, or anything else like that, and that is not the case uh, with custom properties. So as I've said already, custom properties are dynamic, um, and where CSS is concerned, dynamic, dynamic means that they're um, scoped to selectors and subject to inheritance and the cascade. And I just want to give you a little like visual example of what that means, and we've kind of already seen it, but if I apply this CSS here, you can see that the color of my slide heading, my primary color, has been updated uh, to tomato, and you can see that that's affected every slide. But I can, of course, change this uh, here, and I can just say, um, I think this is what I called it. Yeah, so I can just say like the, only this dynamic slide and that is now only affecting this particular example um, here. So that's kind of what dynamic means with custom properties and we'll show you some more examples of that um, as we go through as well. Okay, so in addition to, um, to being sort of like dynamic or static, custom properties uh, and variables can also be global or local. And again, if you, if you write JavaScript, you'll know what I mean here. Variables can either be applied to sort of everything within an application, or their scope can be limited to specific functions or blocks of code. And custom properties are kind of the same. So by default, custom properties are scoped locally to the selectors that we apply them to. So they're kind of like local variables. But custom properties are also inherited, and you'll know what this means if you've done things with like font properties or color or any other thing that you want to force to inherit in CSS. And that means that like when we're looking for the va retrieving the value of a custom property and there's not custom property assigned to that particular selector, it's going to walk up the DOM and find the nearest parent um, that has that particular custom property and it's going to inherit that value uh, from there. And that means that custom properties are kind of global as well. And especially when we apply custom properties to the root selector, um, which is a very common pattern you see in a lot of examples, including some of mine, but it's not really a pattern that I would suggest you use too widely. Okay. I love when I put the microphone on my throat and you can all hear me swallow. <laughs> so this idea of like global and local variables and stuff is not just like limited to code. There's like global and local things in design as well. And if you look at any design system, and this is just like a wide screenshot of the material design system, you'll see like um, consistency in terms of colors, sizes, shapes. Um, so design has things that are global and things that are local as well. So some of the local things are like um, the button size variations, whether like an avatar is on the left or the right of a component. These are local things that like change from component to component. And then you have like global things um, that are, you want applied like consistently across your application, right? You want your spacing and your topography and all of that, um, hopefully, to be consistent. So as it turns out, most global things in design, most global things in CSS are also static, right? Your topography doesn't change from one build to the next, typically. Definitely doesn't change from one component to the next. Maybe there's a few little exceptions, but typically you want these things fairly um, consistent. And they can change, but where it does happen, it tends to be like a a global redesign and not something that happens regularly with a mature product. And for that reason, I think that you should consider using preprocessors um, for static variables. And aside from helping keep like those dynamic and static concerns separate, it visually denotes them in your code and that makes your CSS a whole lot easier to read and therefore easier to maintain 
as well. So don't necessarily just jump to it because you can. Um, so you might think that given my fairly strong stance on that last thing about all global things being static, and, and remember when I say static, I mean pretty much preprocessors, you might think that, okay, well, if all global things are static by reflection, all local things should be dynamic. And yes, I agree, kind of. Um, that tendency is nowhere near as strong as the tendency for global things to be static, and I think that it's perfectly okay to have uh, locally static variables sometimes. And particularly in the case of like complex um, UI components. But of course, complex UI components don't make fantastic slides. So I've got the simplest version of that uh, that I can, which is a, a bunch of buttons with different sizes. Again, pretty lazy of me, really. Um, but basically, you can see that like just as a developer convenience, I've got three variables here that dictate the different sizes. And I'm using them on different classes there to get those different sizes. You've probably all done um, something like this before. Now, obviously, this would make a lot more sense if we were using these variables more than once. It would make even more sense if we were deriving padding and margin or using, like, you know, preprocessors to do maths or something like that. Um, so, yeah, obviously, that makes more sense, but you can do it like this too. And, and something like that, I think it's perfectly fine to have <coughs> preprocessor variables, and I like to prefix them with the component name so that I know that these are local variables. You can use any prefix you like, or you can choose to prefix your global variables, but for me, it helps to know that these are local static variables because the, most of my static variables in my code, if I'm using uh, custom properties, are going to be more global in nature. The topography, the, the constants, things like that. Maybe you'll capitalize them. Find some way to differentiate them, I think, is the point that I'm trying to make. Um, now, I want you to imagine a situation where on a small screen or a mobile device, you always want to use the small variation. Um, and then like above, say, 800 pixels, you want them to use these sizes here. So like, no matter whether you've used the large class, on a small screen, it's just always going to be small. And suddenly we have like a more dynamic situation, right? And in that case, I think it makes sense to continue using this, and this might be a pattern you use if you're like refactoring code, um, where you make these like locally static vari um, variables into dynamic local variables. And I want you to have a little look at this example here. I know everyone sort of hates reading code, but let me explain it. I have one custom property here called button size. I assign all of my buttons the value of button small. Now, you might be wondering, what's this little hash and the curly braces? In SAS, that means I want you to output the value of this variable um, instead of doing anything with that variable because you only need this in special cases. And it just so happens that the value of $BTN-SML is a valid custom property value. So I don't know why you would use it, but you can write that in CSS. So this just tells SAS I want you to output the value of that variable. So now we can ignore that. So we've got um, a custom property that's assigning a size of small initially, then above 800 pixels, what we're saying is for the button medium and the button large, I want you to use this other property here. We're changing the value of the same custom property. At no point yet have we used that custom property. It's not until down here on the button class, which is applied to every button, um, that I'm using or retrieving the value of that custom property. And that will know because it's scoped, the variables are different depending on the other classes that are on those buttons. So what we kind of have here is a separation of like the logic component and the, and the declarative code for styling um, CSS. And, and this is just an introduction to that example and it will begin to make more sense in a moment. But I want to take a little bit of a breather now. Um, a little bit of a diversion and remind people to not be too clever. So this is an example of some code that I saw um, in an article by Bill Sawyer on the free code camp medium. And I kind of love it. It's like it creates an array, it loops over a bunch of um, numbers basically and then pushes like a character code converted to a string into the array to get the letters of the alphabet, right? And it's small and it's concise and obviously it's faster than typing out all the letters of the alphabet by hand, especially since we have like a lot of Chinese speakers here as well. I, I imagine that would take a long time, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, um, so it's cool, but like in production, I'd much rather have something like this, right? Because the fact is we read code far more often um, than we write it, and I want to see what's inside um, that variable immediately. So something like this makes more sense to me um, in a production setting. And the same thing can be said for custom properties as well. Now, when custom properties were new, someone sent me this example, and I was like, oh yeah, that's awesome, and for about like, an hour, it was awesome. And I'll, I'll quickly explain it actually. So what, because custom properties um, run in the browser at runtime, 
This is generating like a modular scale, which is like a series of numbers that relate to each other. Has anyone used modular scales before? They're just imagine headings that sort of get larger and the rate at which they get larger gets larger as they get larger. And <laughs> makes so much sense. Um, and so basically what it's doing is it's, it's multiplying this ratio by the value of the previous custom property to step up in the scale, right? You don't have to, you don't have to like understand how that works. But what you do have to understand is how cool it is that I can just change the value of the ratio and all of those other values will be updated automatically. So I can switch from a 1.2 ratio for my heading sizes um, to a 1.33 ratio and that's cool. But then I realized that in production, once again, I'd much rather something a little bit more like this, right? So again, I want to be able to read those values. By all means, I think that you should experiment and do things like the previous example. But in production, maybe consider something like this. Um, now, this isn't perfect as well because it violates the rule earlier that sort of global things should be static. And I feel like these are like kind of global. So I'd much rather use preprocessor variables for this as well and then convert them to like locally dynamic properties using the, the method that I showed you with the button before. So, and what the other reason for it is basically when you have something like this, you can end up doing a thing where you go from using font size one uh, to font size you know, two to font size three inside um, media queries. And that's really not how custom properties should be used. That's how um, static variables are used. So I want to say be careful of familiar patterns, right? So here we've got an example of like a font size small and a font size large. And then initially we're applying the small size and then we're using a media query and we're applying the large size, right? That's exactly what you would do with SAS. And this is typically the wrong thing to do with custom properties. Um, what you want to do with custom properties is change the value, not the variable. And what that means is this, right? So we have an example um, class again, we're applying the example font size. We have a variable called, it's, that, that custom property belongs to that selector. And then we update the value of this same custom property using a media query. And then we only have to retrieve that value once. Once again, we've got that separation here where the code, where we apply the um, custom properties and the code where we sort of like declare all of the logic that relates to them. Do people sort of see the difference there that I'm demonstrating? A few nods. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm running out of time. I just want to quickly talk about custom properties for responsive design because it relates kind of to the previous example. Um, one thing you can do is if you're using a media query or anything to update the value of a normal CSS property, then maybe that thing should be a custom property. Stick it in a custom property, move it up to the top of the page along with all of the rest of your logic that changes the value of that property. Um, and then down the bottom, you'll have like one place where you use all of your variables. And if done correctly, this means that media queries should only be used to update custom properties. And this is, if you take this to the extreme, it sort of feels a bit weird at first, but it's actually really nice. And what it does is it helps you separate the logic from the design. And I've come up with this metaphor that I call like a logic bulb, which is like, um, I'll, sh I'll show you what it is. So basically, um, in this example here, this is the code that would be like above the fold, what I'm talking about when I keep doing this. Um, and that means that we have like, in this example, I'm creating like a, a grid type system here. And I'm creating a row which initially is set to display block. Uh, and then using a media query, I'm setting its display to flex, which will mean that like any flex properties that I've applied to it will come into effect. So basically, um, a grid system that starts off full width all the time. And then above 800 pixels, it, it applies the logic. And then below the fold, we have the logic. So you can see that there's no media queries here. Um, here I'm using, um, applying the value of the custom properties. And what I can do now is I can look and see anywhere that I've used a var statement, I immediately know that that is a value that's going to change. And with previous methods of writing CSS, there was really no way of knowing this, right? You'd have to, I I'm sure many of you got very good at reading and understanding CSS on the fly and keeping track of things in your head. I don't want to be good at that. Like, <laughs> and it's amazing how good some of us got at it. So basically, um, what it results in is like this highly declarative code below the fold that's kind of like the CSS that we used to write before media queries and before a lot of the complexities of the modern language and it feels really nice. And I can switch between examining like the logic of my application or the logic of my components to examining, okay, what styles and what variables are being applied. And that separation is really nice and it actually makes CSS a whole lot easier to read and maintain as well. And one of the big advantages is it makes things easy to delete as well. 
So all of those are, are um, I think, huge advantages to using CSS in this way. Okay, one and a half minutes, I'm gonna talk about theming. So theming is kind of the exception to the rule. I was saying before that like all global things should be static. Um, I'm gonna give a caveat for theming. So theming, I mean like changing the value of the colors on your slide deck, for example, or on your Twitter profile, or like updating the profile picture. These are all examples of like theming, things that are individual to different users of your application. So, um, I think that we should capitalize global custom properties. If we're using, like if you're theming something, you can use the root selector. You can say, okay, this is the thing that I want across my entire application. And I'm gonna say my default theme color here um, is tomato. And then I'm going to do this. And I'm sorry that wrapped, hang on a sec. Yeah. Um, so what, I, what I'm doing here is I'm setting the value of theme color um, to the value of user theme color if it exists. And the second value inside the var statement is a fallback value. So what that means is, here I'm saying the theme color is user theme color or tomato if it doesn't exist. And then what we can do is we can, for each individual user, we can just say the user's theme color is, in this case, Rebecca purple. And then I say the background is theme color, which will inherit from here. And then the value um, will be updated. Does that make sense to people? So basically, what that allows is you can say, I have a deep. Yeah. Am I out of time? Yeah. All right, well, that's it. I was on my last slide. Now, you notice the, the second half of that talk might have been a little bit sketchy, and this is what I was doing today um, instead of working on my talk. And there's another video where, like, I absolutely nailed it, triple backflip, but this is the one you're getting. <laughs> All right, thanks so much. How do I stop this? Turn it off. Hello, hello. So, how did you write uh, that slide? Sorry, how? Those slides. Um, Reveal.js and the code editor thing is a custom thing I wrote using carbonnow.sh. Uh, reveal. Mike, can you disconnect yourself? I don't know how. Just how do I do it? Thank you. You're in luck. We have time for another question. I'm trying to put on my game show host voice. Apparently, it's not working. Oh, it is. Awesome. Uh, this looks really awesome. Uh, is the custom attribute something similar to the preprocessor variables? Like, does it require anything to be run custom in the browser? Attributes. I mean, uh, what you introduced just now. Is it the same as the SAS? Uh, variables. Sorry, uh, custom attributes. What What do you mean uh, by so that? The, I mean, sorry, sorry for messing up with the name. No, but you're right. Was that uh, what you introduced similar to the SAS uh, variables? So a custom property is similar to SAS. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, only a little bit. Like they're not really even variables. So, so they are kind of standard technology going forward in the future. They're native in the browser, unlike preprocessors. Yeah, uh -huh. you don't. It's not um, custom properties are not a preprocess preprocessor pre step. Fantastic. And they're supported in all browsers, so you can use them. Tomorrow, says downloads go down. <laughs> all good. All good. Thank, Thank you. you.